Good morning. Welcome to Edmonds Adventist Church Sabbath School, our time for the church at study. We are here each Sabbath morning from 10 to 10.30 to look at our Sabbath School lesson. We use the Adventist Sabbath School lesson quarterly. This quarter, that is from uh, July, August, and September, our lessons are called Making Friends for God, The Joy of Sharing in His Mission. Let's pray as we begin. Our Father in heaven, today as we open your word and we look at some stories from the life of Jesus, may we be touched by his love May we understand what it means for us to share in his mission. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to focus primarily on two stories today that are in our lesson. Both of them involve Jesus and women, and both of them involve Jesus and people of another race or nationality. One hundred years and three days ago, that is August 26, 1920, the Secretary of State of the United States certified the 19th Amendment that gave women in this country the right to vote. That means that when my parents were born, women could not vote. Now, the last state to ratify the 19th Amendment, allowing women to vote, came just a few days earlier on August 18, 1920. The vote in Congress that led to the uh, passing of the 19th Amendment and led states to be able to ratify it came in May of 1919, a year and a half earlier, May 21, 1919. But do you know when that amendment was first introduced into Congress? Passed in Congress May 21, 1919. It was first introduced in 1878. It took 41 years for Congress to decide to allow women to vote. A few years ago, my son and grandson and I went through the World War I Museum in Kansas City. We noticed that there on the wall in one section, they had a number of posters from World War I. Most of them were advocating buying war bonds or joining the military, but one of them was about women's suffrage. It was quite pointed. At the time, Woodrow Wilson was the President of the United States, and of course we were fighting Germany and the Kaiser, and in this poster they called him Kaiser Wilson. Quite an insult. And here's what they said on the poster. Kaiser Wilson, have you forgotten your sympathy with the poor Germans because they were not self-governed? 20 million American women are not self-governed. Take the beam out of your own eye. Well, it was, I guess, uh, protests like that that eventually led to women having the vote. Jesus had some encounters with women that certainly went against the grain of the culture and the mores of his day. Today we're going to look at two of those. So take out your Bibles and open them with me. The first one is found in Mark chapter 7. Now, Mark 7 begins 
with a discussion about Jesus' disciples not washing their hands in the proper way before meals. You see, there were all kinds of rules about clean and unclean in Jesus' day. And Jesus was willing to break those rules. And so there's a debate between Jesus and the Pharisees about that. But Jesus was not just concerned about rules of clean and unclean things. He was concerned about the rules between clean and unclean people. And so right after this discussion about clean and unclean things comes a story about a woman who would have been considered unclean. We start reading with Mark chapter 7, beginning with verse 24. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. That would be in present-day Lebanon. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For such a saying you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. So here we learn about, uh, first of all in the chapter, unclean things, and then an unclean spirit, an unclean demon, and a woman who would have been considered unclean. And when she comes, this Syrophoenician woman means that she was of uh, Phoenician descent and from the area of Syria. Uh, when she comes... She asked Jesus, and Jesus gives her a response that seems very troubling. He says, listen, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And of course, Jews called Gentiles dogs. I really wonder what was going on here. I would love to see a video of this rather than just read it from the text. Because I kind of have a feeling that if we were to see a video we might see a gleam in Jesus' eye that gave her an invitation to go on and say what she did. I don't know. Some people say maybe Jesus was even learning himself in this encounter. But however Jesus responded, even though he says it's not right to take the children's food and give it to the dogs, she has this great comeback and says, hey, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs under the table. And notice Jesus doesn't say anything here about faith. He simply says, that's a great saying. For saying such a thing, go home. Your daughter is well. And he went home, she went home and found the daughter well. Now this same story is over in Matthew. And in Matthew it is somewhat different. And this is unusual in a way because generally Matthew follows Mark's account, but Mark has more detail in most of the stories, and Matthew abbreviates them a bit. Matthew, of course, likes to focus on Jesus' teaching. But in this particular case, Matthew gives us much more detail. And I think in that detail, he is certainly making a point. So let's look at Matthew's version. Now open to Matthew chapter 21, pardon me, chapter 15, and let's begin reading with verse 21. Same story, but notice how much is added in Matthew's account. We'll stop and notice some of those things as we go along. Matthew chapter 15, beginning with verse 21. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region 
came and started shouting. Let's stop right there for a second. While Mark calls her a Gentile, a Syrophoenician, which would have been the correct technical term in that day, Matthew calls her a Canaanite. Now the Canaanites, of course, were the people who inhabited the area of Palestine before the Jews came. Remember, they were considered the evil people. They were the people that, the, that God's people were to overcome. And yet, people there wouldn't have been called Canaanites, really, in Jesus' day. But I think Matthew is emphasizing that she's a descendant from those people who were the bad guys in the Old Testament. This woman is not just a Gentile. She's part of the very group that was considered, well, unworthy to go on living, the Canaanites. So the connotations are very strong. This woman is not just a Gentile, but she's of the worst kind of Gentile, a Canaanite. And she shouts at Jesus, and she says, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Now that wasn't in Mark's story either. She calls him son of David which, of course, would have been a term for the Messiah. David had been given the promise that his people, his descendants, would rule forever. And so she recognizes him as son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon, but he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. That's another detail that wasn't in Mark. The disciples are offended by what Jesus is doing. He's offended, they are offended that he's even talking to this woman. They say, send her away, she's just a bother. Get her out of here. It's not the only time, as we'll see later on today, that the disciples are offended by what Jesus does. You see, Jesus is going against the grain of what they think is appropriate behavior. Jesus answers, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, as we have seen in Mark, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall under their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Now, this is also something new that wasn't in Mark's version. There, Jesus didn't talk about her faith. He just said for such a saying as this. But here he talks about faith. Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. So what we see here is Jesus going against the grain of his culture in more ways than one. One, it would not really be appropriate for a rabbi to be speaking to a woman. And second, this is a woman who is a Gentile. This is a woman who is a Canaanite. The disciples are offended. But Jesus goes against the grain of the culture and he heals her daughter. There is a myth about Jesus. I hear it often. The myth is that Jesus came and only had a spiritual mission. He was not involved in issues that are social issues or political issues. He was only involved with the spiritual. Well, he certainly did challenge the social norms of the day. So it's not quite true that he only concerned himself with the spiritual and not with 
social issues. Jesus is willing to go against the grain of the culture because for him, his mission is a mission for all. And developing a winning attitude in witnessing includes being willing to show Jesus' true mission, which is to break down the barriers that stand between people, barriers of gender, barriers of race, barriers of ethnicity. Well, let's go to another story in our lesson today. It's a familiar one. We find it in John chapter 4. And again, Jesus encounters a woman. And a woman who is a foreigner. Beginning with the first verse of John 4. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with the Samaritans. The word really implies that they, they don't use the same utensils. If a Samaritan has touched a utensil, then you don't touch it because it's unclean. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get living water? Living water on a literal basis, would simply mean running water as opposed to well water. And running water was always preferred to well water. And so here they are at a well, and Jesus says, well, I can give you running water. But of course, there's a, a spiritual dimension to the term living water, as we will see. And then the woman asks him, Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? And with his sons and his flocks drank from it. Now this is a theme that we will see several times through the Gospel of John. The question, is Jesus greater than? And we will find out that Jesus is greater than Jacob. That he's greater than Abraham. That he's greater than Moses. So here it's the emphasis on Jacob. Are you greater than Jacob? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give be, will become in them a spring of water gushing to eternal life. The woman said to her, him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. And then Jesus changes the subject. He says, uh, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And it's interesting how now the woman changes the subject very quickly. She says, Sir, I see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. In other words, let's not talk about me. Let's talk about mountains. That's more comfortable. Let's talk about which mountain is the right mountain to worship on. Jesus answers, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. 
For the Father seeks as such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When He comes, He will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am He, the one who is speaking with you. Now notice something that we saw in the other passage about the Syrophoenician woman. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way. Uh, pardon me. They left the city and were on their way to him. And then we read down in verse 39, Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this truly is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Not just the Savior of any single group of people, but the Savior of the world. The disciples and other Jews at the time considered Samaritans unclean. In fact, there's a statement from the rabbis that says that just as a Jewish woman is unclean during her menstrual cycle. Samaritan women are as unclean as a menstruate their whole lives, from the cradle to the grave. But here Jesus breaks with the norms and encounters a woman who would be considered unclean, a foreigner, and a woman who had had five husbands, which means probably there is also some question about her, although it may not have been her fault. But so a woman of, of some probably disrepute among people, a woman who was a foreigner, and the very fact that she's a woman. Men were not to talk to women in public. So what is going on here? We're supposed to be talking about witness in these lessons. And all too often we think about witness as simply trying to get people to believe what we believe. But I think our witness is much more than that. It comes from our entire life lived as a community of believers. And one of the things that Jesus emphasizes is the inclusiveness of the gospel. He is truly the Savior of the world. That means that a community of believers that is really going to witness for Jesus needs to give a witness that is consistent with Jesus' witness. That means a willingness to break down the barriers that stand between people. And I'm going to kind of quit preaching and go to meddling here for a moment. I wonder in our own church, our denomination, if we can have the kind of witness that Jesus calls us to give at a time when we still discriminate against women, when in most of the church, we refuse to ordain women who are working alongside men and in the same kind of ministry as men. Right now, if you go down to the Southeastern California Conference, where I used to pastor, of the three largest churches, the Loma Linda University Church, the La Sierra University Church, and the Azure Hills Church, two of those 
have women as senior pastors. Now, fortunately, I believe in that conference and in the Pacific Union, they do ordain women, although there have been threats about that from higher up in the organization. But how can we give a witness to the world of the Savior who breaks down barriers, the Savior who goes against the grain to show that in Christ there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, when we continue to discriminate. I also wonder how strong our witness can be when in much of the country we still have separate conferences for people of color, at least for African Americans, what we call regional conferences. Now, fortunately, here in the West, we don't have that. But what kind of a witness does that give to the world? You see, all too often, I think the church has said, we're not going to rock the boat. And so we wait until the culture changes and then we follow it. And we should be leading the culture because we have the witness of a Savior whose mission was to show God's love, but to show God's love for everyone, to show that He is the Savior of the world and to go against the grain to break down the barriers that stood between people. I hope that in our individual lives and in our church's witness, we can truly give witness to Jesus. We can truly share his mission by doing what he did in the world, showing God's love, God's inclusive love that breaks down the barriers between people, all those things that separate people on the basis of race, on the basis of gender, and declare one better than another. Certainly there are differences. God loves variety, and he has made us different. But his love embraces all equally, and he expects us to treat all equally, if we really believe that. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the witness of Jesus. Forgive us when we have been so cautious that we fail to carry on his witness of the all-inclusive love of the Father. Give us courage that we may truly show that witness to the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stay tuned for our worship service that will begin at 11 o'clock in just about a half an hour. Right now we're in, the, in a series of sermons on the book of Proverbs called Living Wisely and Living Well. Today we take a look at what the book of Proverbs has to say about marriage. So please join us in a half an hour at 11 o'clock. We'll see you then. Thanks so much for being with us this morning.